Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome to Dome at Home. Hopefully you can all hear me. We're going live to Zoom, our friends on the Zoom uh, webinar here. We are also going live out to Facebook and for the first time to YouTube Direct. So you can watch us uh, in any of those spots as well. Although a lot of the conversation happens uh, here in the Zoom webinar, and that's uh, where we're able to ask, see your questions and answer questions and so on. We are doing a little bit different this, uh, this week for the chat. We've had, um, the, the chat was so active that it was going by so quickly that I literally was not able to see many of the uh, questions as they went by. And there was also a lot of sort of side conversations and things like that. So we're gonna try things a little bit differently this time. The, uh, the chat is, is um, visible to the presenters, but not to the whole audience. And so what happens is um, when questions come in, we'll be able to uh, read them and we'll repeat them and answer them that way. Um, we have uh, already lots of things coming in. That's great. Um, so this is Dome at Home, a planetarium show where we bring the dome to your living room on whatever device you're watching. It's sponsored by the province of Manitoba's Safe at Home grant. Of course, uh, astronomy is a great um, pandemic pastime. Uh, the restrictions are gonna be loosening a little bit this weekend, but we still stay in home and uh, avoiding things. So looking at the sky is a great, uh, great thing to do. With me uh, is uh, our producer, Mike, who's there in the background somewhere. Mike, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Scott. Hello. Hey, how are you this week? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Good. Uh, did, you, uh, did you see the moon earlier today? I didn't get a chance to get out and see the moon, no. Uh, I, I usually try to do that, but uh, today I didn't. Yeah, well, it's, uh, I wasn't expecting things to be clear at all. And so, you know, all of a sudden I came up from my basement office working with no windows and uh, it was clear outside so i just ducked outside and there was the first quarter moon nicely positioned it'll be hopefully visible right after the show for those of you in around the winnipeg area we'll have some clear skies for those of you watching elsewhere drop something into the chat and let us know where you're watching from we love to see all the people that we get uh, not only here in manitoba but across canada across north america and around the world actually we've had some uh, some regular viewers from all over the place. So let us know where you're watching from and uh, how many people are watching with you. That's the kind of stuff that our sponsors love to know because you know the, the number of people that you reach is pretty important. So that's uh, that would be great. Oh, and look at all this stuff here coming in. This is fantastic. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you all. Um, okay, um, well, let's get started. This, this week, we have an interesting show. Um, it's uh, it's all about Uranus. Yeah, we're going there. It is the planet with the most unfortunate name. We're going to be talking about Uranus or Uranus or Uranus. People pronounce it differently. I settled on Uranus um, or Uranus. Neither of those is really much better. But uh, you can't do a presentation without getting a Uranus joke, especially if you're working with school school age kids. Um, so we're going to be talking about that planet and partly because it's visible in the sky right now. It's really hard to find because it's so far away. It's very, very faint. It's barely at the limit of human vision. If you have perfectly dark skies away from city lights and there's no moon and things like that, but you can see it pretty easily in binoculars. If you happen to have a pair of binoculars, just ordinary, any, pretty much any binoculars will work. And um, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at that uh, in a moment as well. But first, let's uh, let's chat uh, a little bit about our um, reason for doing this show. In some ways, uh, one of my one of my heroes is uh, Dr. Helen Sawyer Hogg, who is a pioneering Canadian astronomer. And um, not only was she an amazing researcher, and she had a career that spanned fifty years, and uh, did all this amazing stuff both at the, the University of Victoria with the the big telescope there, and also the University of Toronto. But um, she also did a lot of astronomy popularization, just not just doing research, but bringing the excitement and the wonder of the universe to the average person to get them excited about science. And so one of her quotes, the stars belong to everyone, that really is true. I mean, no matter where you live, you can see the stars and they're the same stars that people on the other side of borders or people with different beliefs or whatever, all, we all see the same stars. Um, and it's one of the things that can really bring us together. So I encourage you um, within 
the health regulations of wherever you happen to be watching from uh, to observe the sky. Get outside, look at the real sky, and hopefully this, these shows will give you some tools to help you do that. Okay, let's get right into looking at the sky. We have um, been watching uh, the northern sky quite regularly here. We, uh, we found, for example, um, the stars of the Big Dipper. That's uh, tilted up in the uh, in sort of in the northeastern part of the sky. And the stars of the Big Dipper can help us find the North Star. These two stars at the end of the bowl, they point up to the North Star, which is right over here. And the North Star is in the, the Little Dipper. You're not going to see the Little Dipper from inside the city, but the North Star, nice and bright. So, um, the main, uh, the main value of the North Star, of course, is it helps us find our directions, but often you don't necessarily need that, but it can help us find other constellations as well. I'm going to zoom out the view here a little bit just so we can get a, a wider view. So our Big Dipper, the pointer stars point to the North Star. If you go about the same distance and curve a little bit to the right, you wind up at the, the letter M or letter W, depending on which way you're looking at it, I guess of Cassiopeia the Queen. And Cassiopeia was the instigator in our epic constellation tale that we started in back in episode one, and we continued through um, uh, last episode as well. Let's take a look at Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is the W shape, um, and Cassiopeia was a queen. She was very, very boastful about her beauty. She was beautiful, but she knew it, and she was boasting all the time. Her husband, King Cepheus, um, kind of just, you know, didn't do anything about it, didn't talk to her or try and caution her against her, uh, her boasts. Uh, their daughter, Princess Andromeda, who we're just introducing this week, is right next to them in the sky. Andromeda, also very beautiful, but, you know, didn't, uh, didn't put, help put the reins on, on mom either. So Queen Cassiopeia eventually boasted that she was more beautiful than the mermaids, which upset King Neptune. We've heard of Neptune, of course, one of the planets of our solar system is named after him. King Neptune sends Cetus the sea monster, who we met last week. Cetus the sea monster starts ravaging the kingdom and um, causing all sorts of trouble. The king and queen don't know what to do. They go to an oracle, and the oracle says, the only way to appease King Neptune is to take your daughter Andromeda and chain her to the rocks down by the beach and let the sea monster eat her. Eat it. So this is why Andromeda is actually portrayed here with some chains chained up to the rock kind of not a very um, great position for her the king and queen don't want to do this but of course it's either andromeda or the whole kingdom gets eaten by the sea monster so they reluctantly do as the oracle bids and poor andromeda is chained to the rocks and cetus the sea monster swims up towards her and is going to eat her luckily flying by just at that moment is Pegasus the Flying Horse, another constellation over in the western sky right now. Pegasus is, um, it does not look like a flying horse at all. I mean, it's only half a horse, first of all. And there's, there's four stars that make a big square. That's the part you'll see. Everything else is pretty faint and questionable. But anyway, Pegasus the Flying Horse is uh, riding by. And who's riding Pegasus? The hero Perseus another constellation. Perseus is uh, fresh off of um, his latest adventure. He has just beheaded the Medusa, the horrible um, creature with snakes for hair that uh, if you look at her, you will turn to stone. He defeated her by using a, a, a mirror, shiny shield as a mirror that allowed him to, uh, to view the reflection. And then he got up close to her and he chopped, his head off, chopped her head off. So Perseus is flying around with this head of the Medusa. Yes, the Gorgon. That's right, Wesley. That's the, uh, that's the uh, other name for him. The um, Perseus, being a hero, swoops down on Pegasus, pulls out the head of Medusa, and turns Cetus to stone. And Cetus sinks beneath the waves and is lost forever. And Perseus rescues Andromeda. Um, presumably, he puts the head of Medusa in his bag or something like that so he doesn't turn her to stone by accident and of course everyone lives happily ever after no one is quite sure why neptune gives up at that point but for whatever reason he's like oh oh they got me i'm a, i'm a god but uh anyway it there's a, there's a lot of holes in some of these myths 
the purpose of this is not to teach you ancient Greek religion, but to point out that these stories bind together all of these constellations in one part of the sky. All of those constellations, basically it covers a quarter of the sky. And if you were to be um, someone back a couple thousand years ago where there was no TV and there were, were no Google apps to just tell you where the stars were, a story like that would help you fit those parts of the sky together and remember what went with what. So these legends, even though they're not necessarily literally true, were very helpful. And we still use those, those names, even if we don't look for the figures necessarily. So you've got Cassiopeia and Perseus and Cepheus and Andromeda are all next to each other. Pegasus is off on one side and then Cetus uh, is off, uh, actually made of very, very faint stars. I think they were stretching when they, uh, geez, we need some stars that look kind of like a sea monster. Let's use those because all the bright ones got used up. Anyway, these kinds of epic tales, they get made into movies nowadays. 2000 years ago, they were put up into the sky. And that's basically the origin of the constellations. I do want to point out uh, Perseus a little bit more, um, not just as the hero, um, but also as the constellation. Perseus is almost directly overhead right now. If you were to go outside right now and look straight up, basically Perseus is close to the zenith. That's that little dot there with a Z. That's the zenith, the point directly above your head at seven o'clock tonight. So Perseus looks like a chain of stars with another little chain of stars. Um, I don't know how that looks like a person, let alone a guy with a Medusa's head and a... Anyway, that's Perseus. It is actually made of some bright stars. It kind of looks like a little cluster of stars, um, especially if you can get a good view from the dark. It's quite a nice area of the sky. It's kind of cool though, the way they drew this picture, there's, you know, here's these stars make up his body or whatever. And then there's two stars that make the eyes of Medusa. This star right here is actually, was chosen specifically to be the eye of the Medusa in this, in this image for a, ver for a very specific reason. It turns out that that star was evil. It was called the demon, the demon star. In Arabic, that would be Al Ghul. Now we, now we pronounce it Al Ghul. That star got brighter and fainter. Now today, we know that Algol is actually two stars that go around each other and one of them blocks out the other one. There's like a little eclipse as they go around each other. They didn't know that, you know, a millennia ago. They just knew that that star changed and it was different from everything else. And they thought it was evil. And so it's kind of neat that, you know, a thousand years ago, people were watching the sky carefully enough to notice that kind of stuff. And it fit into their mythologies and it fit into the different... Um, aspects of how they put these constellations together. I could do a whole show on Algol, but we don't have time for that, unfortunately. Um, okay, uh, Mike, do you have any uh, any questions there? I, I think I've gotten uh, most of them there. Uh, people commenting just on what they know of uh, the various uh, constellation myths that you've been talking about. Um, oh, so, yeah, yeah, I, see I the, think we're good. Good. I see the Percy Jackson uh, comment, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, so yes, um, the constellations um, of this time of the year, we're, we're pretty much now finished with what I would say are the autumn constellations. And starting next week, we will be looking at the uh, winter constellations. We're gonna start with Orion the Hunter and we're gonna move on from there. Uh, very famous uh, constellation. Okay. Um, let's see here. Just get our PowerPoint back. Okay, um, Cetus, the, the uh, sea monster, is in the southern sky. Don't even bother looking for it, quite honestly, because it's made of really faint stars and it's hard to see. But right now, tonight, the moon and the planet Mars are just above it. Now, the moon, of course, we know changes every night it moves on. So like, don't use the moon as a pointer for anything. But Mars will be in that part of the sky for quite a while. So Mars is sort of what we're looking at. And if you were to look at um, the planet Mars, we will go a little closer here, I think, and we'll zoom in on the planet Mars. Mars is right next to the planet Uranus, or Uranus, or Uranus. I'm going to do that all night or so. Um, if you have binoculars, 
point them at Mars. Mars is still pretty much the brightest star in the southern part of the sky, so it's pretty unmistakable. Point, center your binoculars on that. This circle represents the field of view of your binoculars. It's only, a, it's only about the size of your fist held up against the sky. So you're not seeing a big chunk of sky. You're only seeing a, a tiny little bit. But if you put Mars in the middle, you'll see a couple of other stars here, and you'll see this one here. That's the planet Uranus. It is um, 3 billion kilometers away, probably one of the more distant things that you will see this evening um, in terms of the, the solar system. And uh, most astronomers, or most people, don't get a chance to see it because, let's face it, if, we did, if I didn't tell you that was it, you probably wouldn't know which object in the, in the field of view was Uranus. It just looks like a star. That's why it was not discovered when all the other planets were. You know, basically the first person that ever looked up at the sky noticed Jupiter and noticed Mars and noticed all that stuff. But um, Uranus, because it's so faint, was only discovered in 1781. Um, and actually, funny story, if you're, a, if you're a musical fan, of course, 1781, that's right around the time of, of uh, Hamilton, if you've seen that musical. And you know, uh, you know King George? Well, the person that discovered Uranus um, William Herschel wanted to name the planet as the discoverer. He felt he should be able to name the planet. He wanted to name it George after King George. It's that King George. So every time you think of, um, you, you sing King George's song from Hamilton, remember that we almost had Uranus called George. It's uh, kind of amazing, but even then they realized, you know, naming solar system objects after particular countries, politicians, or royalty is probably not a good idea. Let's stick with mythology. Let's stick with, um, you know, things that aren't going to be political hot potatoes. And so the rest of the world beyond England basically said, yeah, no, we're not calling it George. We're calling it something else. And so it was settled on Uranus, which is um, the, the, basically the, the name for the heavens. Urania is all of the, uh, the universe around us. Okay, so, um, oh, I did want to mention uh, that these charts, as well as uh, all of our other activities, are available on the Manitoba Museum's website. If you go to manitobamuseum.ca slash dome at home, that will, uh, that's sort of our headquarters for all of the activities. And so we have star charts that show you where everything is for every week, and there's other activities and things like that as well. So you can go on there. While you're there, you can click on the join our email list uh, button and that will keep you informed on everything that we're going on uh, in terms of programs at the museum and all sorts of other things. If you're watching... Start, can uh, I, uh, yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt? Uh, I've got a question that I think would be better to be answered by you verbally because typing it in would be just too long. Brooke was asking, what determines how high or low planets are in the sky? For example, Mars is straight overhead right now, but uh, Jupiter and Saturn and Venus are lower in the horizon. I think you could explain oh. that that would help yeah that's a that's a great question and actually you, you're right mars has been very well placed for us to see recently um and and uranus as well because it's close by jupiter and saturn when they were sort of um popular in december because they were coming very close together they were very low down in the sky so there's a couple of things that make all of that work first of all um how close to the sun the planet is for example you know all this all the planets go around the sun it might be that if, if my head is the Earth, the Sun is in the middle and the other planet is, is on the other side, from my point of view, they look pretty close. So if I'm looking at that planet, I'm looking towards the Sun, that makes it really hard to see. That's what was happening with Jupiter and, and Saturn in December. They were on the far side of the Sun, and we, whenever we looked in that direction, the Sun was very close by. So as soon as the Sun would set and it would start getting dark, those planets would set too. So that's one issue. The other issue has to do with, um, I guess it's related, but as a planet is farther from the sun, it can be higher up in the sky. And at different times of the year, the path of the planets, it's called the ecliptic, the path that the planets are moving through in the, in the sky can be low or can be high. And if that doesn't complicate it enough, it also changes as the night goes on and as the whole sky rotates. So Mars is in a part of the sky that it will be nice and high for us in the evening right now. 
as Mars moves in its orbit, eventually what's going to happen is it's going to get lower and lower and then we'll lose sight of it behind the sun, just like we did with Jupiter and Saturn. The, and then the planets will reappear on the, uh, on the morning side of things. So if you get up before the sun, you'll start to see Venus and then Jupiter and Saturn uh, all sort of reappearing there towards the end of the month and into February. Great question. And uh, actually, we'll, we're going to be doing a show, I think, on the, the motions of the solar system. Uh, so that'll be uh, a time when we can get more into that as well. Okay. Let's see here. This was my best picture of Uranus. When I was uh, imaging the planet Mars and Jupiter and things like that back in the fall, we were getting nice images of Mars and you could see the polar caps. We were getting the rings of Saturn and the moons of Jupiter and stuff like that. This is Uranus. It's a slightly larger than dot dot and it's blue. Really not impressive from Earth. In fact, even the better telescopes, um, still only show like this. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of Uranus. Not all that much detail. And partly it's because it's so far away. And partly it's because there isn't really a lot of activity going on there. We don't have the big colorful storms that you have on Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus is really far from the sun. There's not a lot of heat there. Heat is what drives weather on a planet. And so without that heat, there's just not as much activity going on. This is actually our best picture of the planet Uranus. This was taken by the Voyager 2 space probe, the only spacecraft that has flown past Uranus so far. And look, it's, it's almost featureless. You have to do some serious uh, Photoshop pro processing to actually bring out any details. You might notice a tiny little white cloud here, depending on how good your, your monitor is. So why don't we have great pictures of Uranus? Well, because it's far away and it's hard to get to. 35 years ago this week, humans sent a spacecraft, well, not just to Uranus, we sent the Voyager spacecraft out to explore the outer planets. They could not go to the planet and stop and stay there. They basically could just fly by because there wasn't enough fuel to slow down and, and stop. So essentially, they just flew by and took as many pictures as they could as they went whipping past, and then they just went on to the next planet. They were able to visit Jupiter and Saturn, and then also Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 2 made it to Uranus, the only spacecraft that has, has done so before going on to Neptune. And it took some of these pictures. We discovered a lot of things about Uranus just from that. You may know that Uranus is a sideways planet. Its North Pole sort of sticks out the side. Um, it's got rings around it as well, although very minor ones. And this is a depiction of the Uranus's magnetic field. Basically, the magnetic field tells us what the inside of the planet is doing. So the inside of the planet is spinning one way, and the outside, the atmosphere, is spinning another way. Very, very unusual. Very, very crazy. Um, and Uranus also has a whole bunch of moons. 27 moons at last count. And uh, actually, Voyager discovered a number of those. Probably the most impressive moon was Miranda. Miranda basically looks like a moon that exploded and then all the pieces just sort of fell back together under gravity and it's stuck together. It's jagged and, and bits look like they're not in the right place and there's huge canyons and things like that. It's a really, really chaotic place. We wouldn't have known anything about it without Voyager, basically, because it's, it's so far and so small that it's just a tiny little dot. Now, we think that the entire Uranus system was suffered an impact in its early formation. As the planets were all forming, little pieces would crash into them, kind of like uh, if, you, if you were outside with a snowball and you roll it in the snow and it gets bigger and bigger. Kind of analogy for how the planets were made. Well, as Uranus was getting made, some other snowball came in and hit it and basically knocked it over. And so instead of spinning around this way, it sort of spins around this way. And that's why it's sideways. We know that happened early in its formation because all the rings and the moons and things like that formed and orbited that same kind of way. So it, it's not something that happened recently because that would have had a weird effect on all the moons. The moons might have been going in all sorts of different, uh, different angles as well. So really interesting planet. And like I say, now's a good time to actually go outside, get your binoculars, and you can, uh, you can see that planet in the sky. 
the last image that we ever got of Uranus from the Voyager spacecraft is this one here. And it's, I mean, it, it shows almost nothing, but I think it's really beautiful. It's the, the, the sort of blue clouds of, of Uranus. It's a gas giant planet. Um, oh, I can't believe I, I missed out on this joke. Um, most of the outer parts of the clouds are made of methane. So Uranus smells like farts. Yes, it does. That's a scientific fact, kids. Sorry, I, what can you do, right? The, um, the clouds of Uranus really are um, a beautiful blue color though. And here we're basically seeing the dark side of Uranus. This was the last view that Voyager had as it sort of looked back towards um, Uranus. The sun would be just out of the frame this way. They make sure the sun doesn't go in the camera, but basically the sun would be over there shining onto that side of, of Uranus. And this side of course is just the shadow. So, um, we still do observe the planet Uranus from Earth. These are images from the Keck telescope, which is a, a pair of gigantic telescopes on, uh, on a mountaintop in Hawaii. You can see that there's some clouds there. There's some bright clouds, uh, you know, not quite like the great red spot on Jupiter, but some storms like that for sure. The rings show up fairly well. This is, a, this is an infrared telescope, so it, it's able to see the rings even though they don't give off a lot of light. So we are able to sort of keep tabs on Uranus, but it's the kind of thing that it, to really understand it, we would rather send a spacecraft that could go there and stop and just orbit and, and see what happens over long periods of time. Because if you only know one or two you know, days worth of, of what a planet is like, you don't really know it at all. Imagine if you could only know about the Earth from one day in human history let alone one day throughout the entire formation of the of the the entire age of the planet you wouldn't really know very much at all it would totally depend on what day you got there so the planet uranus uh still lots of things to study and uh very interesting place for sure i hope that uh one day we'll get out there and and get a little bit more information but of course as the uh the new t space telescopes come out the new generation of space telescopes they'll be able to see farther and better and hopefully we'll get some uh, some good images uh, as well. Okay, um, let's see where there have been piles and piles of questions zooming by there, Mike. Anything that uh, you want to bring up here? Uh, lots of people just wondering about how they can see planets uh, and stars from here in the city. Um, oh, there's a specific question about Uranus's size compared to Earth and Miranda's size compared to our own moon. Ah, okay. Well, uh, yeah, the, uh, the we're going to compare Uranus's size to uh, the Earth's actually in just a little bit because our, our activity uh, this week is starting out on the scale model of the solar system. We're going to show some scale of what the planets are like. Um, Miranda is um, a little bit smaller than our moon. Our moon is actually quite big for, for the size of the planet. Um, so it was, uh, it, it's, it's quite large uh, as, as moons go. But Miranda is a little bit smaller than our moon. And uh, yeah, good question. This is uh, some of the moons of Uranus. And most of them are from um, William Shakespeare plays, actually. That's what they're named after. They started running out of Greek, and Ro Greek gods and Roman gods and things like that. Um, and so they started using characters from, I think, The Tempest and uh, Twelfth Night and a few things like that. So there's some familiar sounding names out there at the outer edge of the solar system. All right. Let's go back here. Um, just to finish up here with our where things are in the sky, we're going to move around and just take a look at the southern sky. There's the south. Tonight, the moon is right next to Mars, basically. And uh, so it's a nice night to sort of go out and, and uh, see it. Even if it clouds over a little bit, you'll be able to still see the moon probably through the thin clouds that uh, it looks like that are coming in. As time goes on, though, those things all move around. And so tomorrow night, the moon will be that far away. And then the next night, it'll be that far away and so on. But you see, Mars is pretty much still in that space. If we zoom in just on Mars, we start to see the other things that were visible. And there's where the planet Uranus is 
quite close by, um, again, fitting in the field of view of binoculars. And it's almost directly below it. So if you get out there with your binoculars, definitely try that, uh, try that out. Um, oh, I see a question here from Asha. Um, do other planets have clouds? Great question. So the Earth, of course, has clouds. We see them all the time. The planet Venus has lots of clouds. In fact, it's totally covered with clouds. Mars has clouds. And all of the outer planets, the, the, the giant planets, they're made of clouds. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all made of clouds. In fact, the only planet that doesn't have clouds is Mercury. Every other planet does. So that is actually, I, I never thought of it that way, but clouds are one of the most common similarities between, uh, between all the planets. That's a good point. All right, let us uh, move on to uh, our activity. So one of the things we like to do here is try and provide some things that you can do, even if it happens to be cloudy or, I mean, if you do go outside tonight, it's pretty darn cold, so make sure you dress warmly. But we like to do some in inside activities as well. One of the things that people often ask is, how big are the planets compared to each other? How big is this from that? How far away? Those kinds of things. We're going to make a model. And the best way to sort of understand these things is to make a model of the solar system. And it gives us basically a sense of, how it all fits together. So, oops. My mouse wheel keeps wanting to change slides for me. So here is a picture of the solar system where all the planets are shown to the same scale in size. Now they're obviously not this close together, but this gives you a good sense. So here's little Mercury over here, just a tiny little, oh, you're not seeing my, mouse. But from the top left there, you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars across the, the top. And then down in the bottom left, you have Jupiter, Saturn with the rings, Uranus down in the center there with, uh, with the, almost no features. And then on the right, you have Neptune, which is blue with some darker spots and things like that on it. So those are the relative sizes. Um, so someone was asking about um, the size of Earth relative to Uranus. Well, now you can see it. But here's the thing. I mean, it's fine to do that on a picture, but it's nice to sort of have something physical. So what, we're, what we've done is we've put together a little worksheet, which is available on our website, manitobamuseum.ca slash dome at home. And uh, Mike, if you could drop the link into the chat windows and things like that, that would be great. Um, it is really fun to do this because first of all, you get to do some arts and crafts. And second of all, you get to do some exercise. So if you're a teacher, this is a great crossover between science and arts and phys ed. I like to use um, this kind of, you know, reusable dough that comes in a container and uh, we're not allowed to use its name, but you can use clay or anything that you want to make basically different little balls that uh, will be your planets. If you don't want to use clay, you can also use, um, you can go scouring the toy stores or your toy box for little plastic uh, balls or um, my, my favorite model, the orange, that's still unfortunately kicking around from two weeks ago. Um, you can find all sorts of different sizes of spheres. If you, if you want, you can also just make circles on a piece of paper and color them that way. I like to go 3D, but if you want to do it out of paper, that's totally fine. So what we do have is we have a um, let's see here. We have this worksheet that uh, you can download and it basically says how big everything is in real life. And then we scale it down by a factor of a billion. So the model we're making is one billion times smaller than the real thing. Obviously that's good because you can't really make something a model that is too unwieldy. So here, if you look, uh, I don't know if you can read the sheet there, but you can download it. Um, Mercury is about 4,879 kilometers in diameter. When we scale that down, that's about five millimeters. So that's about the size of, uh, here we go, it's P. I just pulled this out of uh, the cupboard. So it's right about the size to be Mercury. So that's gonna be our planet Mercury. So that one's already. If I wanted, I would paint this gray and maybe draw a couple of little craters or things like that on it because Mercury is a, a gray cratered planet. The next planet, Venus, 12 millimeters across. 
So I got my ruler here. I got some dough and you just grab a piece and roll it off into a circle of some kind and then just measure it and see where, where you start. This looks like it's, oh, that's 25 millimeters, way too big. Just tear a piece off and make it into a rough ball and then measure it again. That's a little bit better. Okay, so here is Venus. And again, if I was gonna paint it, I could paint some clouds on it or things like that. So we have Mercury and we have Venus. Here, if I can get these spread out a bit, there we go. These are our two models for Mercury and Venus. So you go through, you make them the appropriate size. Now here's the kicker. You have to put these at the right distance from each other. And that's what that last column is. Those are the number of meters from the sun to each planet. And you've, you see that very quickly, the distances get big. For example, Mercury is 57, almost 58 meters from the sun. That's a long way. I mean, that's, you know, a good portion of your, of your schoolyard. Venus, 100 meters. So a tenth of a kilometer already. If you go all the way down there, you see that Pluto is almost six kilometers away from the sun. Pluto would be smaller than Mercury, and it would be six kilometers away from the sun. There's a, there's a link on there that will let you do this using Google Maps, and it will basically um, let, tell you where you have to put all of your planets in your solar system. It's actually a really... Uh, a really fun activity. We're going to talk. We're going to work on it more late uh, next week. So if you want to start collecting uh, materials, and you can um, start making and decorating your planets, next week we will uh, put together our models, and we'll be speaking with a teacher who used this as a classroom uh, technique, and they had a, a great time walking the solar system. So that'll be coming up next week. If you think that this is a worthwhile use of your time please uh, give us a like or a subscribe you can sign up for our email list on the on the website and uh, of course we love to get your questions and we love to get any feedback there's a there's a survey form that is uh, in the links in the comments for the show but you can also drop us an email at space at manitobamuseum.ca that'll just be a great uh, way to hear from you if you have questions you just want to say hi or you want to share us uh, some pictures of your uh, of your astronomy exploits. We'd love to hear your space stories as well. Let's see. We're, uh, I think we have a little bit of time here for some questions. So if anybody does have any questions, you can drop them into the chat. I'll try and pop over and uh, check Facebook and uh, uh, as well. So let's just see uh, if we have any questions here that we can answer. Um, Mike has just dropped uh, the survey monkey thing in there. That really helps us out. Um, getting feedback and knowing if people appreciate the shows. Also let us know what else you might want to what else you might want to see. If you want to see other programs or uh, other topics or things like that. Scott, we had a really good question a little bit earlier on. Someone with very keen eyes was noting that Uranus is fairly plain looking. It's just one sort of solid color, but Neptune, even though it's further away, had a bit of detail to it. I was wondering if you could expand upon that. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very crucial observation. Well done, whoever uh, caught that. When Voyager got out to Jupiter, they saw, wow, great red spot and storms and stuff. Got out to Saturn, wow, rings and storms and moons and stuff. Got out to Uranus, wow, it was kind of boring. I mean, literally not much going on there. And the idea was, well, we're getting farther from the sun. The, there's no sun energy to drive the weather. So we expected when we got to Neptune in, um, I think it was 89, 88 or 89, a couple of years later, um, we expected Neptune to be bland as well. And it wasn't. It has um, the great dark spot, this, uh, this the, um, big storm that's almost like the great red spot on Jupiter. It's got lots of activity going on. We have no idea what's going on. Um, it's not energy from the sun. It's possible that deep down in Neptune, it has um, a core, a solid core, that is big enough that maybe it still has some heat from formation. You know, the, like the core of the Earth has lava and stuff like that, and it's still very hot. Um, maybe Neptune has that. We don't know. Maybe there's something else going on in the atmosphere that is able to make these storms that we don't understand. It is a complete mystery. We don't even know, to be honest, that the, 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 those storms that we saw before 
are always happening because again, we had a flyby that was one day long and we uh, were not able to, um, you know, see what else was going on. There wasn't a, any follow-up. So lots of mysteries. As we get farther from the sun, we know less and less about our solar system. Great questions. Yeah, um, they are great questions. Sorry, yeah. do you want me to give you some more or do you got more? Yeah, to talk yeah, about? we got time for a few more, I think, yeah. Okay, well, we've got a question that's actually been duplicated both in our Zoom webinar and on Facebook. So Abby and Jennifer are uh, noted that you talked about clouds on some of the planets. So they're wondering, does that mean, there, is there water on those planets? Does it rain or snow? Great question. Yes, um, clouds can be different depending on what planet you're on. The clouds here on Earth are made out of water vapor. They're basically made out of water. And so they can rain and snow and all that kind of stuff happens. It's part of the water cycle here on the Earth. The clouds on other planets may be made of different materials. For example, on Venus, there's not a whole lot of water. The clouds there are made out of sulfuric acid. Now there is rain, it's just sulfuric acid rain. So it would not be, you know, the kind of rain that you'd want to go out in or anything like that. It would dissolve your skin. So um, doesn't mean that there's water there. Uh, similarly, for the gas giant planets, most of the clouds are gases like hydrogen and helium, uh, methane, ammonia, a few other uh, materials like that. There is a little bit of water spread around, but it's very small proportion compared to the other stuff because um, there's just not very much water the farther that you get from um, the sun, at least in the planets. Most of the water in the outer solar system is actually in the moons around the planets because, you know, water is liquid here on Earth, but as you get far from the sun and it gets cold, water becomes like rock. And so it, it's like a, like a building block for moons and things like that in the outer solar system. Great questions. Uh, one uh, more, if you, yep, you yep. want to keep going here. Yeah, yep, um, yep, Melissa cool. is asking, uh, is there another probe scheduled to go to Uranus or any of the outer planets? And also wondering, would there be any differences in imaging, given that technology has changed since 1986? Yes, um, you might have noticed that the animations that we're showing here um, are not up to the... Uh, um, the high level of quality that NASA puts out nowadays, because in 1986, I mean, we were talking VCRs. There were no digital um, displays at all. And the, even the cameras were um, very crude compared to what we have. Like the, the, the camera you have in your smartphone is way better than the camera that was on Voyager. So technology has definitely improved, but we have not planned to go out there, the, the, the thing about the, the Voyager probes was that they launched at a very specific time where the planets were kind of, you could sort of connect the dots and go from Jupiter to Saturn to Uranus to Neptune without needing too much fuel. You, you sort of, as you fly by one planet, that planet's gravity would sort of slingshot you and aim you at the next planet that just happened to be lined up in the right spot. Since then, the planets have all moved around and that sort of shortcut, um, method is not available anymore. So basically, if you want to go to Uranus, you can't go to Jupiter and Saturn first, basically. You're, good, you're just going to go to Uranus and you're going to need to use all the fuel to get there. So that means you need a huge rocket. Um, so it, it, it gets fairly complicated. There are ideas for these probes, but because they're sort of one planet deals, uh, it, they're not as attractive as the Voyager um, they called it the grand tour of the outer solar system that got all of them in one shot, basically. I really hope that we get back out there, but um, there's only so much time and effort, I guess, and so much money, of course, and uh, we'll have to see who prioritizes that. I mean, the Canadian Space Agency does a lot of astronomy, um, and Canadians, sorry, do a lot of astronomy. The Canadian Space Agency partners with NASA and places like that to go on, on various missions, but there isn't anything to the outer planets right now. And uh, of course, NASA, who knows what's going to change with all the changes that have happened in the last couple, couple of weeks down in the United States. So we'll, uh, we'll have to see what the priorities are um, in the next little while. Okay, um, I do see one other question here. What would happen if you tried to stand on Uranus? Well, uh, if you've ever tried to walk on the surface of a pool, 
and they're like you, you can't you just you put your foot in and you sink that's basically what would happen um and you would sink and the clouds would actually just get thicker and thicker and thicker as you went down through the clouds until they turned into kind of like a cloud soup and then eventually the the soup would be thicker and thicker and thicker so that it would almost feel feel solid long before then you'd be crushed from the pressure uh, and you would have frozen to death and and run out of oxygen and all that kind of stuff but um right down in the very very center we don't really know there may be a solid core of a small smaller than earth sized solid core or there may just be clouds all the way through hard to say well i think we've reached the end of our show thank you very much everyone I, if we didn't get to your questions i'm sorry but uh drop us an email i will uh, uh make sure that we answer them uh in between so thank you all very much um if you are able to um, drop by the website sign up give us a like and a subscribe that will really help uh, help us out a lot and uh, we're on again next week we'll be talking about mercury another planet that you'll be able to see in the sky yourself and we'll show you how thanks everyone for coming and we will see you again next week <laughs>